Nope. Uh, the resolution's a little bit off. Oh, wait, that's fine. We can start with this. So sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, so again, my goal here today is to tell you a little bit about the fundamental material research that goes on in the material science and engineering department and how these new insights could be enabling uh, paradigm shifting new materials for energy storage and conversion. So very quick introduction about my research efforts here at Stanford. So I lead a research group that looks at the interaction between light, chemical bonds, and electrons. And this is uh, the heart of electrochemistry and photochemistry and fundamental insights on how electrons and ions and light interact can enable us to develop better technologies for fuel cells, that's for converting chemicals to electricity, solar fuel that's taking sunlight and converting back to fuel, and then batteries for storing uh, electricity in chemical bonds. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about the work by several of my graduate students and postdocs uh, who have made uh, um, very interesting discoveries uh, in the area of solar fuels and batteries. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the motivation for storing sunlight in particular. So this is an image of the United States States, not quite good resolution, uh, taken from the International Space Station and shows you precisely the challenge with solar. Um, the sun doesn't shine everywhere and doesn't shine all the time. Secondly, um, the solar resources is highly decoupled from the, uh, the population. So if you look at cities like Tokyo, London, and Chicago, these are places with very high population density but very poor solar coverage. So the key question here is how do we make solar energy available when and where it is required. And storage becomes one of the most crucial aspects. So today I will talk about storage in two ways. Storage in terms of chemical bonds in fuel and storage in terms of chemical bonds in batteries. And I will begin by stating some of the current paradigms in terms of material design. And I will talk about some of the new approach uh, we are taking based on new understanding of these processes. So to take the sunlight and convert that into chemical fuel is no easy business. Uh, this is done by plants uh, in terms of photosynthesis. And we're trying to duplicate this using uh, uh, devices, including organic and inorganic components. One of the greatest challenge with converting sunlight and storing that as fuel is the solar spectrum utilization. So if you take a look at the solar spectrum, it's approximately 5% uh, UV, 40 some percent ultraviolet, uh, and 50% visible. The best generations of solar cells and other photoelectrochemical device can only harvest part of the spectrum. And what happens to the residual part of the spectrum that is not utilized? It is, ends up as heat. And the current paradigm for photoelectrochemical and solar cell based devices is that we cannot harvest those heat very well. And in fact, we should run the solar cells and photoelectrochemical devices at as low temperature as possible. Those who have dealt with solar cells know that the efficiency goes down with temperature. And this is why there has been a huge effort at keeping the solar cell cool and focusing on materials that work best at room temperature. But under uh, illumination, solar cells get hot and their performance degrade. So the current paradigm is keep solar cells and also photoelectrochemical cells. These are solar cell-like devices that can take sunlight and converting water to hydrogen and oxygen as cool as possible to maximize the efficiency, okay? The question we posed several years ago in a project that's now supported by the Global uh, Climate Energy Program Project is can thermal energy available in heat be used to make existing materials better. It turns out that many of the materials we're interested for solar cells are not quite earth abundant and are expensive to process. What we really want is some sort of a easy to deploy material that is low cost, as abundant perhaps as rust to convert sunlight uh, into hydrogen, uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen. One of the big problem with many of these earth abundant material is that electrons don't travel very efficiently in them. In a material like iron oxide, which is um, a close relative of, of rust, the electrons are so immobile, it's impossible to measure how fast the electrons are traveling at room temperature. In contrast to something like silicon, which is used in the current generations of solar cell, the electrons have mobility that is 10 orders of magnitude higher than iron oxide. But yet, 
we have been trying to deploy iron oxide as a material to absorb sunlight and subsequently using the photo excited electrons to do chemistry by dissociating water into hydrogen and oxygen. But as you can see in this figure here, the mobility of the electron in iron oxide, it's approximately, as I said, 10 orders of magnitude lower at room temperature. But as you increase the temperature of your solar cell and your photoelectrochemical cell, the mobility of the electron actually increases exponentially with temperature. At high temperature, it increases by about six orders of magnitude when you go from room temperature to 400 degrees Celsius. And thermal energy, therefore, represents a possible mechanism to enhance the performance of solar cells and photoelectrochemical cells. However, the current paradigm is that as soon as you increase the temperature of solar cell-based devices, the open circuit voltage goes down. Okay? Therefore, you're not able to extract all of the energy that could be available coming in as heat to the cell. So that's a paradigm we tried to challenge a few years ago. And what we found is that many of these materials, like iron oxide, actually have surprising behavior with temperature. As you supply thermal energy into the system, it causes the electrons to rattle a little bit more and able to overcome the intrinsic energy barriers that blocks the transport of electrons in the system. What I want to show you are two very quick experimental results. Uh, first, in iron oxide, what we found is that when we heat up the cell from room temperature to, say, 70 degrees Celsius, we can see a huge enhancement in the performance of the solar cell. This particular metric is known as the fill factor. The fill factor basically describes you how fast the current of the solar cell increases with the voltage. Basically, you want a current voltage relationship that's as square as possible. So these curves you're seeing here, the y-axis is the current, the x-axis is the voltage. You want this to be some sort of a sharp, rectangular-like 90-degree turn. And what we see here, when we go from, say, 7 degrees Celsius to 72 degrees Celsius, the blue curve going to the black curve goes from rather slanted to becoming more square-like. Another way to quantify this is basically how much more voltage do you need to supply to the system to increase the current by a certain amount. So I put two dashed lines there. It's at uh, 0 0.4 milliamp per square centimeter and 4 uh, milliamp per square centimeter. And I'm calculating the amount of voltage needed to gain a one order of magnitude increase in the current of the photoelectrochemical cell for water splitting. And you can see that as you increase the temperature from 7 degrees Celsius to 72, the amount of voltage is required goes down from about 350 millivolt to just 150 millivolt. And this represents a significant saving in terms of the voltage when you do chemistry like water splitting. So we are challenging the view that increasing the temperature only harms the performance of solar cell and photoelectrochemical cells. The second example I want to show you is yet another Earth-abundant material known as bismuth venidate, BIVO4. Uh, you can't see this very clearly in the images here, but we have some very interesting nanostructures uh, on the order of about 150 nanometer that is used to absorb the sunlight, interact with the water, and to dissociate into hydrogen and oxygen. And what we saw here was really surprising. When we increase the temperature from 9 degrees Celsius to 42 degrees Celsius, so this is a slight increase in the temperature, we actually saw the current of the cell increase by 52%. So the current can directly translate into how much hydrogen you can generate from dissociating water into hydrogen and oxygen. Most importantly, when you increase the current of the cell, the voltage barely changes. For every Kelvin you increase, the voltage decreases by about 1.5 millivolt. Okay? So if you basically look at the area under the curve, that is the amount of power you can extract from this photoelectrochemical device, which is turned into hydrogen and oxygen. And you can see the dramatic increase in the y-axis is only accompanied by a very small decrease in the x-axis. And this leads to a dramatic increase in the power density of the cell, which can then be translated uh, into a high-performance water-splitting device. And this is the, some of the new aspects we're working on. What is really interesting is all the examples I've showed you are operating only at 100 degrees Celsius. And our simulation shows that if you're able to go to even higher temperatures, say 3, 4, or 500 degrees Celsius, you can even more efficiently integrate heat with light.
Okay? So what we propose to do is to turn a liquid-based system, such as one that includes water, into a solid-state system, which involves water vapor. And one possible Im implementation is to deploy this device in a concentrated solar plant, in which you have focused sunlight from concentrators, and you supply both light and heat to the cell. And you can use both form of energies to convert water into hydrogen and oxygen, which can later be burnt uh, to generate electricity or power transportation when the sun is not shining. So what is possible? Well, we are now predicting, based on our uh, initial experiments, if we push the temperature up to about 400 degrees Celsius, we will be able to increase the performance of the cells by more than 50% simply by integrating in not only the energy from the light, but also the energy from the heat. Okay? And this can give us efficiency as high as 20%, uh, which is, uh, if in today's standards for converting water into hydrogen and oxygen, is quite remarkable. And this comes from the fact that we are not throwing the heat away. We want to take the sunlight, part of the sunlight that is not absorbed turns into heat, and in turn we use the heat at the same time to then back boost the overall efficiency of the device. So this is a depiction of the current paradigm. The current paradigm is to take solar cells and photoelectrochemical cells like the one I've described, and we take the sunlight and we shine on it directly. This is very much like the solar cell you see just across um, the windows here. Another paradigm, which is known as concentrated photovoltaics, is you take a mirror and you focus the sunlight, okay? But because the current paradigm is based on the understanding that thermal energy is not very good for solar cell, you have to cool it, okay? And because the cooling involved, it makes it rather impractical for deployment at the large scale, especially when water is scarce. Uh, each time you loop the water around, you have a certain amount of loss. But what we are proposing as a possible new route is that we could go ahead and focus the sunlight to generate the heat needed to drive the reactions, but then without cooling the cell, therefore decreasing the potential cost associated with it. So the new insight we're deriving here is that it is not necessary to keep the solar cells or the photoelectrochemical cells cool. In fact, if you let it get hot just by a little bit, you can dramatically improve the current output of the cell and thereby enabling a higher water to hydrogen and oxygen conversion efficiency and therefore enable you a way to store the sunlight in chemical bonds. So that's the first part of my talk. And this is looking at converting sunlight and water into hydrogen and oxygen. A related way to store energy is to take the electron that's generated by solar cells, wind power, and so forth, and put it in chemical bonds in a battery geometry. And we have heard a lot about uh, batteries over um, throughout the years, especially uh, there has been recent excitement from Tesla uh, at home-based battery systems. So I think this is a very timely topic. Battery is a very funny animal because it's a very simple device to look at, but it's incredibly complicated at the heart of it. And one other thing I want to mention about battery is that we always see the schematic of a battery, which is basically shuttling something like lithium back and forth between two electrodes, and then you can generate power. We often see this type of schematic of individual particle that looks nice and well-shaped. But this is not at all the case. A real battery is extremely complex in the chemistry and the microstructure. And one of the major performance metrics we want to push is both the power density and the energy density of the battery. So this is known as the Rigoni plot. The x-axis is the power density. So this is roughly how fast you could recharge your electric vehicle or how fast you can accelerate the electric vehicle. And the y-axis is basically the range of the electric vehicle. So what we need to move is diagonally again on this plot. So we're raising both power and energy uh, density at the same time. What makes it really hard to optimize batteries is that it is not the simple AA cell you see. It is, in fact, a very multi-scale problem ranging from a single nanoparticle on the orders of tens of nanometers all the way up to hundreds and thousands of microns. And we're trying to understand this very complex microstructure and how we are shuttling lithium in and out of the system. So let me show you a real image of a battery. This is a cross-section taken from a commercial battery. You can see it's nothing like the schematic I showed. 
you has all this funny shaped particles, a distribution of sizes and shapes. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see there is even a discontinuity between particles and pores that's between them. This is basically to enable the transport of lithium and electron that's needed to store energy in chemical bonds and batteries. So what are we doing today to help us understand better ways to design batteries? Well, it turns out that we really need to look at the fundamental mechanisms of inserting and removing lithium. This is what determines the rate of the battery and also the lifetime of the battery. So I want to highlight two particular problems that my lab is working on. The first problem on the left here is how current is distributed in the battery. If you think about battery as a simple electrical circuit, okay, you think it's a, it's a capacitor with the active uh, element in it, and when you apply a certain amount of current to the battery, it charges at the set current. Okay? But in reality, what happens is that a battery is not just one battery. It's about a trillion battery in the giant uh, battery cell, like a double A cell. And when you have that many distributed electrical elements in the battery, it's important to understand how current is distributed in the battery. So this is the way I show you two examples of two ways to distribute current to 10 battery particles. Imagine you have 10 distinct battery particles that's interconnected. In the top case, I can uniformly distribute the current in the battery, therefore resulting in a very low and uniform current density through the battery. The second way is I can take the same current, but I shove it into only one particle at a time. So basically, I'm increasing the current density by a factor of 10. But in both cases, externally, I measure the same current. Okay? And the reason we're interested in how lithium is distributed is because the local current density determines the degradation mechanism. You can think in the second case here, the high concentration of lithium current into one particle will cause a particle to heat up more, undergo more mechanical stress during charging and discharging. And these are some of the mechanisms of failure in the lithium ion battery. Whereas in the top case, the current density is much, much lower. But if you don't have insight into the individual behavior of the particles, there is no way to tell the difference between case A and case B. So this is motivated by the importance of degradation. The right plot here shows what happens at the individual particle level. So you can imagine the smallest building block of a battery is a single particle. And we're trying to understand how you can get lithium in from the electrolyte into the battery particle. And the kinetics, or the rate of doing so, directly sets how fast you can charge and discharge the battery. One of the key problems, especially in electric vehicles, is the recharging time. It would be optimal to be able to charge the car in one hour or two hours, rather than, say, completely overnight. And it's being limited by how fast you can insert the lithium into that particle and you can take the lithium out. So full, hopefully I've given you a brief picture of what happens inside a battery. So this is where we come in. We understand the importance of under, trying to um, get a better picture of how current is distributed in a battery and also how lithium is being inserted into individual particles. But the problem is how do we observe them when they're taking place? As I said, the battery consists of trillions of particles. How do I look into one of them and see what's happening? I draw an analog, perhaps um, too much of an analog, to medical imaging. So the reason why we have made so much advancement in medical um, diagnostic in the past 30 years is the advent of uh, MRIs and other, in, um, other uh, imaging techniques that allow us to track disease in the body okay, when the disease is still present. What we need to do is exactly the same thing for energy storage. We should be able to see what's happening in the battery at the relevant length scales without taking the battery apart necessarily. And over the past three years, in collaborations um, with um, the Advanced Light Source here in Berkeley and also Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, we have been developing ways to track how battery is charging and discharging when the battery is working. And we are now challenging this paradigm, which is charge and discharge batteries slowly maximizes the battery life. I think most of us have heard or have practiced the notion of trickle charging. It's a very good idea to charge your battery slowly. Tesla recommends you to charge your battery slowly when you can, rather than in the one hour burst mode. And this is because it's believed that charging batteries slowly enhances the battery life. 
But as I will show you next, this is not entirely true. So the approach we're taking is to be able to dynamically track the insertion and the removal of lithium of batteries. Again, I apologize, it's not showing up very well here, but the top row of picture shows you we can continuously zoom in into the battery from the 10 micron length scale to one micron, then to 100 nanometer. This is a single particle in the battery and the color represents the different charging state. So we can watch a battery going from the charged to the discharge state using uh, advanced X-ray imaging techniques while the battery is operating. Perhaps the best way is for me to show you a video. This is a video of just two particles that's charging. And uh, let me see how well that will show up. Uh, is there any way we can turn off the light for just a brief moment? It's a rather impressive video in my opinion. That's okay. I, maybe I'll just play one more time. And uh, okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So you're going to see the battery particles charge. Uh, go from a charged state to a discharged state. So from red to green, okay? So the color represents how much lithium you have. So you can actually see the individual particle begin to charge. So we're tracking charging and discharging the battery at about a 50 nanometer resolution on a single particle basis. And again, your battery has about a trillion of this per AA size battery, okay? And what we have done is taking this type of tracking of battery dynamics to come up with new models that will address the current paradigm I was talking about. This is another set of images which shows how much of the battery is being utilized when I charge and discharge the battery. Normally, what we would expect is when we charge the battery, the whole battery should go from a discharge state to a charge state uniformly, much like how you fill a bucket of water. But the problem is a battery is not just a single bucket. It is a trillion buckets. So in what sequence do we fill the bucket? When we look at the dynamics of the battery charging, what we have done here is capture about 100 particles of the battery during charging and discharging. And the two color again represents whether the battery is charged or discharged. Rather than as going smoothly from the color red to the color green, we actually do so discreetly. What you can see in the pictures here is a very small amount of the battery is charged at a given time. So you can see in the first picture there, in the figure A, a few of the particle turns red while the rest remain green. In the second frame, more of the particle goes red, so on and so forth until the entire battery goes red. What this is telling us uh, directly is that the time it takes to charge a particular battery particle is far faster than the time it takes to charge entire battery. This entire battery was charged in one hour. The individual particle you see in frame A was charged in less than six minutes. Basically, we think we're charging the battery in one hour, but really we're charging a very small amount of the battery in about five minutes. This gives us the picture that the battery utilization is actually very low. Rather than having the lithium evenly distributed in the battery, it's actually very concentrated. And this degree of concentration leads to hot spots within the battery that can then cause degradation. So perhaps the best way to show you is to look at this very simple plot. What this shows you is the battery is highly hing homogeneous and underutilized most of the time. When you have a very, very low charging rate, Okay, when you charge your battery at just, say, 10 hours or 20 hours, the trickle charging, you can actually see that only 5% of your battery is being utilized at a given time. This gives us what's called the particle by particle 
insertion process, very much like popcorn. So only a small amount of the battery is active, and those particles are being charged extremely quickly at a rate that could be up to 50 times that of the overall rate of the battery. So I can show you this simulation very quickly. This shows you what happens to the battery when you charge it very slowly, just like a popcorn process. You see that individual particle charge one by one throughout. Okay? This contrasts with a more uniform mechanism in which all of the particle charge concurrently. The second picture is what we want because the second picture allows the current to be uniformly distributed, therefore giving us much lower current density, and then you're distributing the current uniformly. Okay? So what is the implication on battery design? The implication is there is a misunderstanding of how the current in the battery is related to the current density. So we can start with the picture on the right. What we found was that rather than having a linear relationship with the global charging rate and the local charging rate per particle, they're actually somewhat decoupled. The blue line is our model. Especially when you go to very, very low charging rate, say overnight charging, you think you're bringing down the current density dramatically in order to enhance the battery life. But what we see is actually the current density remains very high. In the blue line, you can actually see it's decoupled from the global rate. So as you try to charge your battery slower, rather than charging individual battery particles slower, you're actually charging them faster. But you're just utilizing less of the battery. And what this means for battery utilization, which is the plot on the left here, is that when we go to very, very low rate, the blue line is our model, the utilization actually goes to 0%. That means a very, very small amount part of the battery is doing work for you at any given time. And it's only when you increase the rate, okay, then that's when the utilization gets better and the current is more uniformly spread out. So this is providing a very counterintuitive picture which is that when you slow charge your batteries, it's actually getting much, much more heterogeneous and non-uniform. And this results in these electrochemical hotspots, which causes the battery to grade. So this is the second paradigm we're challenging here. Slow charging may not be the best for your battery. And these insights being provided by dynamic imaging of individual particle charging and discharging is giving us clues on how to design better charging protocols and discharging protocols to enhance the rate of charging without sacrificing the battery lifetime. So with that, I would like to thank our um, uh, funding agencies. So the solar fuel work is supported by the GSET program here at Stanford, as well as the Precore Institute of Energy. Uh, the energy storage work on the battery are, uh, is primarily supported by Samsung uh, Electronics, uh, DOE, and also the NSF. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Will, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, any questions or comments? I was wondering if you have studied the hotspot formation or the rate of charging as a function of the particle size that you show there, going all the way from micron down to nano size. We have, and actually we found something very surprising. The conventional wisdom is that we go smaller, it should be better. But actually we found out that not to be true at all. The reason is, uh, let me show you in this picture here, as you go to a smaller particle, it becomes increasingly more difficult to connect the particle to the electron pathway in the battery. So remember, to charge a battery, you have to have access to the lithium, which is the liquid, and also the electron, which is in carbon. As you make the particle smaller and smaller and smaller, the chances of being contacted to an electronic pathway gets lower. It's basically the same example as a highway. So when you make your particles small enough, you're not going to be close to a highway. And when that happens, it actually causes the performance of the battery to go down. So we actually found there was an optimal size. For this particular battery chemistry, it was about 200 nanometer. If you go below 200 nanometer, then the likelihood of connecting to an electron superhighway uh, gets less probable, and that increases um, the uh, hindrance to charging the battery quickly. Other questions or comments? 
Well, let's take the opportunity to thank Professor Chu again. Thank you.